Welcome to the Magnet Seminars. Uh, these magnets are, are hosted by myself, Anita Dichiara and Greg Patterson, with the help of um, uh, Michael Grapponi and Nick, uh, uh, and Nick Van der Boon and Richard Bono. Uh, and that we thank, and the logo is by Simon Lloyd. The seminar format is as usual. Uh, it's 25 minutes presentation, uh, where everybody's invited to keep microphone off. off. Um, and then after that will be 10, 15 minutes question discussion. Uh, text questions always welcome, and we will leave time uh, to answer to the speaker. And you're invited to have um, uh, to write in the chat nomic if you want to uh, to read the, your question up. It's an informal environment, so if you need to go, don't worry about it. Uh, the seminars are recorded, and there is going to be time to catch up as usual after the seminar, and that's not going to be recorded. So um, joining me in welcoming today's speaker is Andrei Kostler from St. Petersburg, St. Petersburg State University. And, uh, and Andrei is going to talk about magnetic minerals in archaeological ceramics. Old wine skins and new wine. Okay. You're welcome to share your screen. I will mute myself. Yeah, now. right, right. Moment. Okay. Does it work now? Yeah. Can you see my screen? Yes, thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Anita Drakes, thank you very much for having me here uh, for making it the seminar. And I would like to acknowledge my uh, collaborators on this project from Sofia, Maria Kostadinova and Maria Kavachova, and my, also my colleagues from St. Peter uh, Institute in St. Petersburg and in Moscow. And uh, as, you, as we all know, the archaeomagnetism is a uh, subfield of geomagnetism with long and Distinguished history. So, okay, next slide. Yeah, <laughs> buttons apparently don't work for me. So, I just uh, I didn't get prepared. The laser and the field, uh, uh, and the field is. Uh, alive and vibrant uh, these days and very recent, uh, re recently this month a feature article has been published in Physics World which is a newsletter for Institute of Physics UK uh, which caught very appropriately digging up magnetic clues and those clues are of course the behavior of uh, the magnetic field of the uh, centennial and millennial scale, uh, which is of so much interest to geodynamic models, models. But one phrase in this uh, otherwise very, very good uh, readable account has uh, stopped my attention. I read it. I read it now. The field of archaeomagnetism relies on the fact that clays or uh, other materials containing magnetic minerals, usually magnetite, and so forth. And uh, I highlighted two words here, which I don't agree with, uh, because uh, well, definitely the materials that uh, uh, constitute our artifacts do contain the magnetic minerals, but, uh, no, uh, but, but it's not always the case for, for the starting material. If, we understand it this way. And the, the second and more serious misconception is that the, this magnetic mirror is claimed to be magnetite, which is, uh, which, uh, which is simply not true in most, uh, in most cases. Not in all cases. I, would, uh, I will see, uh, come to it later, but in most cases it's true. And so uh, this uh, Brings us back to the magnet, uh, to the medium that keeps our records, uh, and without which we couldn't have this record at all. This brings brings us to the magnetic mineralogy of the archaeological art, and it's a bit. Uh, it came to me as a bit of surprise that uh, 
uh, when I started working on this topic, uh, that uh, uh, the serious attention to the magnetic mineralogy has uh, uh, has not began until approximately mid 90s when these three papers uh, with <clears throat> this uh, telling uh, uh, titles uh, had been published. And uh, at that time, and uh, even the first uh, experiments uh, uh, has shown that um, uh, something uh, very di uh, very different from what we normally expect in paramagnetic samples is, is often observed in artifacts. Uh, in this figure, you can see the, one of the samples from huge collection kept in Sofia. Uh, and uh, uh, the three axis lower test shows a uh, very uh, uh, tremendous drop of uh, hard, uh, hard uh, two Tesla component of magnetization below, below, below something like 240 degrees centigrade. And if, um, and if you look at the uh, IRM acquisition curve, we see that um, uh, we see that um, uh, at least uh, half of uh, magnetization is acquired above 300 millitest. At that time, uh, the authors uh, preferred the Preferred to call this phase geotide, which is of course cannot be true because uh, since uh, then this brick would consist fifty percent of geotide, which is which, uh, which is not possible, of course. And uh, so we have to uh, seek for um, alternative explanations. So that, that's it for it. And it, it took another roughly 10 years that uh, this phase uh, demagnetizing below 200 degrees centigrade has, uh, has been recognized as a separate entity and called high coercivity, thermally stable, low and working temperature magnetic phase by Macintosh and others. And um, uh, more recent studies has shown that this this phase is uh, very often seen in, uh, in bricks, tiles, pottery, and so forth uh, from many locations around the world. Even more recently, uh, Spanish groups joined with Mary uh, again uh, has suggested that uh, have suggested that uh, this uh, H HCSLT phase could be. A, uh, it could be related to a particular polymorphic form of iron-3 oxide, which is called epsilon iron-3 oxide. Okay, to, uh, to summarize this introduction, uh, what do we know from um, about the magnetic mineralogy of archaeological artifacts? It, uh, they, all, uh, they always contain a soft, uh, magnetically soft phase, and uh, very often, one or two magnetically hard phases. Well, magnetically hard phases, I mean the, those phases that uh, have the coercivity in, in excess of uh, 100, mill, 100 millitesels. So, okay. uh, magnetization, uh, thermal magnetic analysis normally yield, uh, yield, uh, yields uh, purity temperatures around uh, above. 500 degrees centigrade, which is compatible with many types of hemite. But uh, on the other hand, um, uh, the very transition, which is would be indicative of stoichiometric magnetite, uh, has been seldom reported, to, uh, or I would rather say never reported uh, from ceramics. And finally, the lowest the axis iron test reveals uh, the quite often reveals the magnetic hard phase with unbroken temperatures around to below 200 degrees centigrade, sometimes much below. Uh, so uh, in, uh, instead of uh, sometimes uh, single mineral paleomagnetic samples, we have to deal with at least three magnetic phases, which uh, magnetite, magnetite, and 
also a, this AC SLT phase, all mixed in various proportions depending on the sun. And so, uh, on the, uh, yet another consideration is that um, starting material for making ceramics doesn't contain those minerals. No, well, nobody to my knowledge has seen uh, clays having magnetization as high as uh, basalts so, or so artifacts. And so, so this magnetic phases has, uh, has to be produced during the uh, firing process, uh, whether it was intentional or not. And so it, uh, we can hope that uh, by, uh, by investigating the magnetic minerals, we can learn something about the, uh, making, uh, the manufacturing pro uh, process as well. So uh, this was the background of our project that used uh, 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 as a sample, back, back clay from and bricks from archaeological sites in Bulgaria. So very rich, uh, they had very rich uh, selection in there, and also some bricks from uh, more recent times in Russia, covering for uh, covering uh, mostly the uh, second millennium BC. Andre, apologize for interrupting, but um. Could you talk just um, facing forward to the microphone? It's just that it's yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm trying. Yeah. Okay, okay, I'll Thank try. I'll, I'll try to do, to do that. Uh, yeah, the hearing is a bit problematic. Yeah, okay, I'll try. Yeah, and the methods we we used apart from the standard rock magnetic method was uh, the IRM acquisition and DC demagnetization uh, curves measured at high temperatures up to. Uh, well, up to above 600, but actually it depended on the sample, of course. Also, we uh, measured some magnetic curves in the cryogenic temperature range from 2 Kelvin to room temperature, and also acquired the hysteresis loops and DCD curves uh, in fields up to seven, uh, seven Tesla fields, which is, which is essential uh, when working with ceramics. Now, uh, br briefly to the results, and uh, here uh, you can see the room temperature, uh, uh, seven Tesla high stress loops, so, uh, row loops are in black, correct, uh, corrected for high field slope, uh, are in red, and uh, one can immediately see that uh, this hard place is really hard. Uh, we, we don't saturate the magnetization even in seven Tesla field, and the loops are open until uh, until three or four Tesla. And of course, uh, just comparing uh, comparing the uh, figurative points at the day plot uh, from uh, seven Tesla loops and from one point eight Tesla loops, we can see that they uh, for uh, for the same uh, for the same specimen they could. Uh, uh, plot in a, uh, quite different parts of the diagram. And uh, about the only uh, thing, uh, about the only thing in common is that uh, we have relatively high MRS over this ratio and relatively high ACR over ACR ratio, as we should expect from a mixture of soft and hard phases. So now uh, more, uh, more, uh, advanced experiment, uh, the um, uh, monetization versus temperature. Here, uh, I, here I plot SIRM and HIRM, which is simply a hard uh, uh, part of uh, IRM acquired above 300 millitesla in red, in, in black and red, respectively, and in blue, uh, in blue blue triangles are the ratio. And uh, we can see that the, in this, uh, uh, those, sample, those samples from Bulgaria were selected specifically to contain the HCSLT phase. Uh, but still we, we can see that the, uh, they all uh, have this decrease of uh, HRM SRM ratio towards 200 degrees centigrade, but afterwards the behavior could be quite different. And uh, in at least three of these samples, uh, we also have a significant 
hematite phase. About the same in, in two out of four samples from uh, Russia, sampled in uh, near Yaroslavl. But uh, there are also other samples that, uh, that are magnetic, also magnetically hard, but still they don't have much of the HCl salty phase and have, and have something like substituted, uh, quite strongly substituted I mean, hematite. Hematite, since we have quite high HIRM um, SIRM ratios up to about maybe 300 or 400 degrees centigrade, and then it uh, goes steadily down. So it should, it should must be some form of uh, some form of hematite. Now, just my, um, if we look at the temperature dependence of the coercivity. Uh, we know uh, in the HCSLT phases, uh, phase, which is where it is not the most interesting, we can say we can typically observe, uh, typically observe the behavior like that. The coercive force uh, drops quite sharply between 40 degrees centigrade and 160, and then uh, levels, levels up. And the anatomy of this behavior is very, uh, is, is very straightforward. In uh, at room temperature and, uh, and slightly above, uh, the zero magnetization axis is crossed uh, in the hard phase, but uh, starting at uh, approximately, uh, probably at 180, which is uh, shown there as a sort of bold yellow, uh, yellow curve. Uh, the, the crossing occurs already in the soft phase. And uh, so we, the, the curves above 180 are more almost indistinguishable. So my, uh, my favorite, my otherwise favorite uh, technique, the low, te the low temperature curve, unfortunately for ceramics, it does not produce anything, uh, any decisive uh, evidence for what these phases are. Apart from maybe the uh, from hematite, may, maybe hematite in 2820. And uh, to sum up, uh, we do have HCSLP phase. And uh, we, another, uh, the second part of the talk would be trying to understand what, uh, to understand better what this phase could be. And so, um, just epsilon iron oxide, as it known in the material science, uh, is, a very, is a peculiar uh, polymorphic uh, form of iron three oxide, which crystallizes uh, in uh, the orthorhombic lattice, um, orthorhombic crystal lattice, and its interest in the in the magnetic material science is that uh, stems from the fact that it has a huge course uh, course of force at room temperature exceeding one uh, exceeding two teslas in most perfect samples and in this uh, very carefully orchestrated uh, synthesis uh, sakurai and others has shown that um, having the uh, one uh, uh, one can obtain uh, four, uh, four polymorphic forms of iron three oxide depending on the uh, calcination temperature, which is which shows uh, here, uh, uh, which is shown here uh, with numbers. And another important uh, takeaway from this uh, from this study is that. Uh, uh, Epsilon iron oxide has a very narrow stability uh, stability field in terms of grain size. Uh, after uh, uh, the particles larger than 30 nanometers, again, once again, in this highly, uh, uh, highly uh, very perfect, perfect synthetic root, uh, particles uh, larger than 30 nanometers. Uh, had become unstable and uh, transformed uh, first to bitter 
uh, iron oxide and finally to hematite. Uh, what, uh, what is, uh, and uh, also the, at that time, curie temperature of the epsilon phase was believed to, have, uh, to be around 500 Kelvin, but it all, uh, uh, it was cast uh, in the, in, in the doubt in the, in, uh, with this paper by Garcia Muniz and the others who, who showed that in fact, this feature is not a, is not a real curie temperature, but rather a, 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 a temperature which shows uh, where the transition occurs from between two uh, phases, which, which are both ordered ferromagnetically, but in, in a different way. And the epsilon, what we, what is known as epsilon phase, epsilon uh, hard phase, it, it has much higher magnetization and much higher coercivity than the high temperature phase. But still, the high temperature phase has a coercivity uh, up to uh, forty milliamps. Uh, non and not not non negligible. Uh, magnetization, which may, may be of importance in, in the context of archaeomagnetism, of course. So, uh, a bit more, uh, a bit more uh, from the literature. At cryogenic temperatures, it's in a very stra strange way. Uh, it, it has a, a quite uh, decent coercivity at uh, four Kelvin, about seven hundred millitesla. Then the high stresses nearly collapses at uh, between uh, 85 and 100 Kelvin, and then develops into a loop which is uh, 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 which is a trademark of this iron oxide at room temperature. And the coercivity is, uh, as I told, above two tests. The susceptibility versus temperature or the tenon uh, this way in. Uh, on 10 nanometer sample behaves also in quite uh, interesting way and uh, would be, and that, uh, that uh, temperature depends, it would be a, uh, uh, could probably serve as a, uh, uh, as a discriminant for that phase where, where it's uh, observed in, Natural, uh, work in uh, also, the 10 nanometers, uh, 10 nanometers epsilon oxide was also studied with uh, uh, high stresses measurement, and it, uh, it, it has much smaller coercivity, but still uh, the coercivity is uh, above 100 millitesla, apart, uh, apart from this uh, range around 100 K. And uh, so even the, uh, so that means that even the smallest uh, epsilon particles could be uh, could carry the magnetic signal at room temperature. So uh, all this uh, all this previous uh, measurements have been done at highly perfect uh, uh, highly perfect material using the approaches that are common in magnetic material science. And so we decided to perhaps, uh, that perhaps we could produce less perfect and uh, uh, less perfect material that would resemble uh, the arche archaeomagnetic sample a bit more. And so we did, uh, we did that using the quick and dirty method. So in the, where the silica gels were impregnated, two different silica gels were impregnated with a precursor, iron green precursor, and then a calcined at 900 degrees centigrade for four hours. And there you can see that uh, depending on the gel used, uh, the samples uh, differ in color. That, that one contains obviously more hematite, as, as you can see in the thermomagnetic curve uh, as well. And uh, that one contains uh, obviously less hematite. And uh, we also had, uh, we also seen that the transition temperature of epsilon phase is a bit different in these two cases. But the 
On the other hand, the high squeezes properties a true temperature has, uh, has, uh, has shown something, something really very, very strange, particularly for this brown sample. For that sample, it's, well, it's more, more or less similar to what we would expect uh, in uh, ceramic, in some ceramics at least. Uh, uh, Corset is high, but, but uh, not as high as you, as you would uh, expect for perfect synthetic epsilon, uh, epsilon phase. Corset of remnants is also quite high, and higher than we normally see in ceramics, but otherwise uh, this sample resembles a little bit uh, a little bit the behavior we saw in the uh, in the ceramic samples. But the brown sample is a is an enigma for, for us at the moment. And uh, I, I plotted it here just to, just to show what could happen. Uh, and uh, ob obviously, uh, it has. Uh, uh, we can see here the result of uh, coexistence of uh, uh, two phases with extremely contrasting coercivity. The coercive force uh, on the major loop is ju uh, just about four. Micro Tesla, but the loop is, is uh, remains open up to four. Uh, sorry, milli Tesla, of course, milli Tesla. But the loop itself remains open uh, up to four Tesla. And on the other hand, okay, from here we could we could hope that red sample could be an, uh, some kind of analog to archaeological samples. Brown sample is, prob is probably uh, not, not so good analog because no, uh, nobody would see, see so that that behavior in our samples, unfortunately. <laughs> well, but uh, on, on the other hand, the cryogenic temperature, uh, the measurements at cryogenic temperature uh, uh, shows that uh, red sample shows both more in tradition as one would expect, and also this uh, this maximum at around hundred uh, Kelvin could be related to epsilon phase. On the other hand, low temperature curves are nearly featureless. So if you uh, inspect them closely, you will see some plateau around 100 and some kind of uh, transition, more, uh, sign some kind of signature for more transition, but nothing else. Brown sample is uh, absolutely crazy, and uh, I don't, I still don't know if it's the instrumental artifact or not. But just to, I'm showing just to uh, for. Uh, 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 to account for this, uh, to account for this, uh, for this particular experiment. Okay, now uh, uh, we can also compare the results uh, of uh, our archaeomagnetic archeo samples uh, directly with known with known data for for synthesis using the. High resist measurements at cryogenic temperature. We did that for uh, for a few samples, and uh, for all of them, uh, we, see, we see just a monotonous decrease of coercivity between five Kelvin and room temperature. Nothing, uh, no collapse of high resist loop, and also the remon uh, the remnants uh, deduced from uh, high resist loop follows very closely the decay curves of the uh, of the remnants given at 1.8 uh, tesla so uh, there there seem to be quite a discordance between uh, the observations done on synthetic epsilon ox uh, epsilon iron oxide and on uh, ceramic uh, ceramic samples effectively one possible way to Resolve uh, to to uh, bring this uh, this data to close to closer agreement is to suppose that uh, uh, 
uh, epsilon facing uh, archaeological samples is highly substituted this method, but this of course needs uh, further investigation. Now, much ado for epsilon phase, and we are getting back to magnetite. And uh, just maybe one month ago, I would I would say magnetite is never observed in archaeological samples, but never say never. Uh, recently, we studied a few. Uh, a few samples from uh, Iron Age sites in Bulgaria, and they all they, sh uh, they showed quite nice very transition, doubled one even in this case. And also uh, interesting thing about this to say these two samples is that ZFC curve runs higher than FC, which is a which is obviously. A, uh, an indicator of rather large grain size of magnetite in this particular sample, in this particular sample. And that, that magnetite uh, is, not, to me, it's not very likely that it could form in situ and it uh, could be inherited from, uh, from the, the starting, uh, starting material for the source. And so I, I would, Conclude on, on the few takeaways uh, as a, just following the following the stream and um, the main uh, the major problem about the the magnetic mineralogy of uh, archaeological artifacts is uh, is the origin uh, is the identity of the HCSLT phase and. The comparison between the properties of archaeological samples and the properties of synthetic epsilon oxide shows that uh, these properties are quite dissimilar, and particularly at, particularly at cryogenic temperatures. And uh, um, probably one possible uh, possible explanation would be to Allow for some metal substitution uh, in natural samples, but uh, but again, that has to be studied experimentally. That, this uh, absolutely has to be studied experimentally. Uh, second uh, issue related to this HCS of the phase is that um, in the light of uh, discovery of uh, Garcia Muniz and others, can it carry remains above the temperature of its apparent disappearance from the record? And does it really disappear? That also need to be, uh, that does also need to be seen in the future. And uh, I still insist that stoichiometric magnetite seldom occurs in ceramics and baked and bay clay. And on the other hand, uh, if it's still uh, if it's still found in some samples, uh, can we can we use the, this as an inference for some particular conditions of uh, these samples and uh, have seen in the past? So thank you very much for your attention. Yep, I think I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh... Let's give a big round of applause to Andre. Thank you very much. Um, we are now open for questions. Um, if you want, you can drop a question in the chat or you can ask yourself. Um, some questions. So I guess the I will I will start with the with the curiosity. Oh, so the the late the last uh, slide was really interesting because it summed up really what what you did so far. Do you plan to uh, to to uh, deepen the study of this epsilon magnetite? You can unmute yourself, yes. Yeah, yeah, I do. Uh, uh, well, 
this uh, this synthetic samples I showed were uh, obtained just within last few weeks, and so of course we. Uh, well, one idea is to start to add some uh, metals apart from iron to this uh, synthesis. Uh, and uh, I didn't tell I didn't tell that in the presentation, but this um, uh, in the material science they add uh, some uh, alkali earth to uh, earth, most often barium. Uh, just to, uh, to, uh, to produce the uh, pores in this pores in the silica which are exactly of the size of the stability of epsilon phase and by this uh, by, uh, and it, it's by this method they uh, obtain the particles uh, that are very perfect in shape and uh, have the coercivities in excess of two tests uh, two tests but in natural samples, uh, I think the, we can we cannot exclude that uh, we have we could have some calcium or magnesium uh, in our in our rocks, and uh, I'm wondering if uh, this um, uh, this light alkalis methods metals could uh, work in the, in the similar way. Another thing is that um, just. Uh, uh, we have uh, we have several uh, candidates metal candidates uh, for uh, which could substitute iron uh, and uh, it's uh, as yet it's not known what would happen with these particular metals the rats uh, once again in material side they uh, they use the substitutions for completely different uh, Purposes and uh, not with metals we would like to uh, them to study, particularly not with titanium. And uh, but but uh, in the recent study, uh, the in the recent study, uh, the, the team for a team a Spanish team uh, that uh, uh, discovered the high temperature phase of epsilon oxide did the did the same using the chromium substitute. Uh, Epsilon phase and the transition temperature expectedly goes down, which is uh, which is fine, which uh, yeah. which, we, which we would have hoped for. And also, but the but the high temperature phase uh, also exists in this substitute at uh, epsilon oxide as well. So it's uh, so it's uh, quite a rich field for further study. Of Yes. Yeah, with important implication, for sure. Greg, you had a question? Uh, I do have a question, but uh, Despina has, has one as well, so we'll let, uh, we'll let her ask first. Sorry, I didn't see the hand raised. I apologize, Despina. Uh, don't apologize because I'm very bad in, uh, in all this stuff. So um, my question to Andre is first, uh, the, all of this research is very interesting and I read your paper yesterday. So I have a, let's say an overall view, but what I would like to ask you is uh, very elementary about the choice of your uh, collections. I mean, you choose one collection from Bulgaria and one from Russia. The first one is mostly uh, Neolithic with a couple of Roman bricks. The second yes. one is medieval bricks from uh, Russia. Um, and then it, it seems that there are differences between these groups. Can, can you tell us a few words? Uh, I mean, this is a difference. It cannot be geographical. So the, is the environment from where these collections come which is different or what? I would very much like to, to have an answer to that, maybe through an email. I mean, you don't need to reply now. Just yeah, that. well, this, that's, a very, that's a very good question. Yeah, and, uh, but, uh, uh, well, we, uh, yeah, we work primarily with Bulgarian samples just because they, they were, um, this is probably the best collection around the world, which- uh, I cannot hear you, Andre. I cannot oh, hear you. Oh, I'm, 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 I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm trying to speak okay. to the microphone. Okay, no, it's better, it's better. Yeah, now. great. Okay, the Bulgarian collection is uh, obviously one, uh, probably the, 
the, be the best available collection yes. in the world. So uh, yeah. Nearly everything. If, if, if there is a material left of, uh, of the other studies, then they would have this material. So, uh, be it uh, 20, uh, be it 10 years old, 20 years or 50 years. Yes. Yeah. And uh, just uh, Russian samples were included because they we did see uh, some interesting uh, interesting difference between the Bulgarian and Russian samples, particularly the, those two that have uh, those two that uh, have the this HCSLT phase have it. Uh, uh, the properties is uh, are a little bit different. The temperature at which uh, the, this phase disappears from the okay. Okay. disappears is uh, uh, maybe as low as 120 or 140 degrees centigrade, which is lower than in Bulgarian samples. And there was also uh, some uh, few samples from Novgorod, which did, uh, which have seen uh, where we saw the both, okay. uh, uh, both epsilon phase, both HCFLT phase and Domin but they were domin clearly dominated by hematite. Uh, so, uh, so we tried to uh, find more, as much di uh, as different samples as we could uh, simply. Because, okay. well, I think 120 is probably the lowest, temper uh, the lowest temperature at which this uh, HCSLT, uh, HCSLT phase disappears uh, ever reported. So basically, the reason was that, yeah. Thank you. Uh, why why okay. there are so okay. much? Uh, and to me, the difference, uh, those differences are quite big, and but we still don't have clear answer of why. Okay. Maybe I will contact you through an email because I have maybe a couple yeah, of other questions, yeah, yeah. but not now. Great, Thank great, you, Andre. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thanks. Magnets for starting collaborations. <laughs> we see that coming. Yeah, that, that would be great. Yeah. So, um, thank you, thank you. So, uh, Bruce has a question as well. Raised hand. Andre, uh, interesting uh, talk. Bruce. Interesting talk. You know that epsilon phase must be uh, related to the actual clay composition in the original pot that got fired, and that yeah. epsilon phase seems to form from iron rich smectite clays for the de dehydration of those clays at high temperature. Yeah. Um, where that, probably not titania, but aluminum calcium um, might be more important yeah. um, yeah. iron substitutions. Yeah. Yeah. We have to look indeed. Yeah. Because uh, well, uh, yeah. And, uh, unfortunately, the, the problem is that uh, the clay sources are not always known for uh, archaeological uh, artifacts, particularly for more ancient ones. So right. it might be a problem. Uh, uh, that uh, that could be uh, that was uh, that is what we could look into uh, using this Russian collection because, particularly this Yaroslavl collection, it uh, comes from. Uh, churches which were erected between uh, in 18th century mostly and so in the in this case we can try to track the uh, sources uh, from documents so it might be uh, it's good uh, it's a good idea uh, good thing to do and we'll try to, we'll try that yeah I know your paper uh, that you you, you hit the non night and uh, ended up with something similar. Yeah. Yeah, that, yeah, that was uh, yeah, that 35 was years back. We saw progress. I know that. But, uh, well, and uh, yet another, there was yet another study in material science that also hit non tronite and uh, ended up uh, and uh, obtained also epsilon like phase. But unfortunately, no magnetics was done on that. But uh, that, that has to be investigated, yes. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Anybody else with a question? I can't see all, all of you, but uh, you can unmute yourself if you, you do have a question.
Greg, do you have a question? Um, yeah, so I guess my kind of question is, is how might you expect this? So you, you described the epsilon phase as having an apparent Curie temperature, which is maybe related to, to a, a change in the phase. Yes. Um, how might you expect that to manifest in a remnants experiment, like a, a paleo intensity experiment, for example? Well, I would rather hope it, it would not have a great effect because uh, the high temperature phase of uh, high temperature epsilon is much weaker than the low temperature. And hopefully it would not be uh, in the real in the real samples. I I would believe it would not be distinguishable from methemite or hematite because yeah, the coercivity range would be approximately the same. But it would be it would be curious to investigate that in in synthetics. Well, there was a, recently the. the Sp the, Sp the same Spanish group that uh, that I mentioned uh, published the paper uh, where they tried the, tried to do the Celi experiment on the highly highly perfect synthetic sample. This is uh, this is a Lopez Sanchez and that was 2020. But unfortunately, the the powder was uh, dis uh, dispersed in epoxy, which could not be heated above. <coughs> To 35, uh, 235 degrees centigrade. So we do, we still don't know what what would happen. We still don't know what would happen in highly perfect sample. We still don't know what would happen in sample like our red uh, material. We can, uh, it's something that we have in mind to try. Thank you very much. I guess this was the last question because we don't have much. Uh, um, space for another one, but you 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 can share email after that. Yeah, so if anybody else. Yes, yes. So okay. um, okay. so the uh, we have some uh, uh, schedule already lined up. Uh, the next uh, um, the next seminar is going to be with Jay Shah taking us into space somewhere again, and then the fourteenth of April we're going to have Andrea Biederman, and then we're going to take a break for the EGU. And we hope to do um, Eastern Hemisphere time slot uh, in, in the same month together with the EU. Uh, so we, we are working on that. And if you have any suggestion, uh, comments, if you want to give a talk with us, you can uh, feel free to contact us. Thank you very much all for coming. <laughs>